Oh my god, man, we're gonna show it on camera. I've been working on six f***ing years. <laughs> Along the way, it's like computers became tools for like convenience, like tools for entertainment, tools for consumption. And Daylight is just trying to come back to the early hippie days of computing for helping you think, to read, to write, to go to the higher echelons of what it means to be human again. It's e-paper, but it's the same speed as an iPad. Daylight is a computing company that's trying to make a healthier, distraction-free computer. Uh, Jobs had this quote where he was like, what a computer is is a bicycle for the mind because he would show this chart, an animal's efficiency of locomotion, and humans were like somewhere in the middle of the list. And then he showed a human with a bicycle is like way on the top of the list. We're kind of average apes, but once you put a tool on us, then we're special. And that was the original vision for so much computing. If you look in the corner, that's an original Mac. And Daylight is just trying to come back to the early hippie days of computing. What does it look like for a computer to be about a bicycle for the mind, for helping you think, to read, to write, to go to the higher echelons of what it means to be human again? So, yeah, can you show it to me? Wait, I need like one second, because this is yeah. gonna be the first time we're fucking showing this. What if people don't like it? Let me make a second one. Huh? Let me make a second one. <laughs> so this took six years. We're gonna launch. Well, by the time you're watching this, it might have already launched. The key thing that Daylight has been built around is a new display technology we invented. We call it Live Paper. It's like e-ink, but a lot faster. But really, my favorite way of describing it is it's a Kindle on steroids. You can see it in the sun. It doesn't have blue light, but it's the same speed as an iPad. And so what this means is finally, it's not just an e-reader or an e-note, it's actually a general knowledge work computer. You can have a stylus, you can write on it, you can read on it. We built our own PDF renderer, so you can get some pretty dope performance. Whoa. Uh, you can do ChatGPT on it, you can do Notion, you can do Google Docs. Uh, you can even run the Kindle app on it. So we like to say it's a, it's a better Kindle than the Kindle. Just to see that it's real. Traditional off-the-shelf e-ink, the way it's able to, to kind of be reflective e-paper is it moves these ink particles up and down. Think of it as a football field and the black particle goes to here for it to be black and then the black particle goes to here for it to be white. And that's what takes the time is it has to run the length of the football field. What we did instead is a different format of e-paper where instead of running the length of the football field, it just runs from sideline to sideline. And so you can do that shift really quickly. And so that twist can be done 60 to 120 frames per second. And that's how we we're able to get it to be so fast. There's a big trade-off with this, which is e-ink is bi-stable. It sticks. Like whether you've turned off your Kindle for like the next six months, the next six years, it'll just keep whatever's the last image. We had to trade that off. So we don't, we don't have bi-stability, but for me, it was a worthy trade-off for the speed. One of the key difficulties we had to solve, how do you simultaneously keep the polarization of light yet diffuse it? So the problem with these kind of existing memory LCD displays, this old technology, what you see used in Game Boys, they're not very paper-like. One of the key properties of paper is it can diffuse light in a Lambertian spectrum. And so when you try to diffuse light and you use a kind of rough diffuser, you break the polarization of light. Uh, you're unable to actually then create black pixels because that's actually one of the techniques we use is we use polarization. And so one of the core technologies here are these micro-reflective structures, which are these sub-wavelength geometries um, etched into silver, which are able to simultaneously diffuse light, yet keep its polarization. And it's, it's just magical. It's absolutely magical that you've created geometries um, that if you try to have the same size, but they were just like rough, rough scratches, like what you would see on paper, polarization would be broken. But with these particular geometries that you're able to etch in, you're able to keep both these properties. That's one of the core technologies at play here. And there's a, there's a bunch more involving kind of diffusion films and polymer lithography. Basically, you're able to directly control the angle of a column made in a gel polymer. And you can use that to be able to diffuse or bend the light. You can use these things called dichroic dyes that allow you to be able to uh, remove any kind of coloration. Um, and therefore be able to keep it to be paper white. It started off working with a Japanese lab, uh, making a prototype. And then after that, it was convincing a manufacturer. There's only one manufacturer in the world who could, could build our thing. I remember this meeting where it'd be like two of us on this side of the table and on the other side of the room, 
there's four, 40 elderly Japanese men and uh, you exchange business cards with them. So my entire table is just covered from this side and that side with these business cards. It took us almost a year to convince our first factory in Taiwan to build the rest of the tablet. Because not only do we have to invent a screen technology and get that produced, we have to create the rest of the tablet, the mechanicals, the electricals. And if it wasn't for all the little tacit knowledge, nothing you can really read in a blog post. It's only a deep conversation, you know, only a contextual conversation that gets you there. This wouldn't exist. I learned that advice is incredibly important and incredibly dangerous. I talked to a famous hardware founder when I first started this. And he's like, there's no way this idea is gonna work. Here are all the ways it's gonna fail and this is what's gonna happen. And he was basically wrong on nine out of 10 counts that he told me. And so if I, if I just indexed on what he said, it would have never existed. On the other hand, there's no way you can do something as complicated as consumer hardware if you have to learn everything yourself and make all the mistakes yourself. So on the other hand, there were some mentors who were absolutely crucial, helping me to understand how to negotiate with a supplier, how to have even credibility for them to take you on. But we had to invent the display technology, get into production, you know, brick by brick. It took six years for us to get to launch. I think what people don't really appreciate about this is it's been a long time since there's been a new computer company. You could say Oculus was the last one. It's the Alan Kay quote, when you're really serious about software, you make your own hardware. Well, guess what? We have our own hardware. And so we can literally modify all of the software, the networking stack, the entire operating system. I think some of the cool things that we wanna explore is imagine if data is not stored at the app level, but is stored at the OS level. And therefore every developer can make first party experiences. Your highlights or your to-dos are not stuck to a particular app and then you have some weird import or export, but it's actually part of the OS. So somebody comes in and they're like, I can make a better interface, I can make a better UI. They're not fighting an uphill battle that they have to import all your data that you have there. Everybody's lived in the jail cell of Steve Jobs. There's like zoom in, there's pinch to zoom. There's only like four or five things. Imagine if you can rethink gestures. Imagine if you can have hot corners. Imagine if you actually had buttons that were a key part of an OS experience. Imagine regardless of what you're doing, there's a walkie talkie button on the side of your, your tablet or your phone. You hold it down and you can talk. We started off not necessarily with the vision of you can talk to the thing and you got a Jarvis, right? Like we didn't know LLMs were gonna be that good, but the possibility of rethinking computer fundamentals. The other cool thing is you can rethink basic primitives that we take for granted. Like imagine instead of always an oppressive clock in the corner, like this was meant to be a flow device. You don't necessarily need to always see the time. Imagine if instead it was like a Pomodoro timer and it was keeping your Pomodoro timers. Imagine instead of a lock screen full of notifications, it's a lock screen that locks to whatever is the habit or content that you wanna do. So if you're learning to draw and you're in day seven, of a 30 day drawing course, your lock screen is the first page of the day seven course. Imagine LLM that's gating your access to notifications and bunching it and bundling it together. Um, so you're not just getting bombarded with it. There's a quote unquote politeness. Right now software has no politeness. Imagine everybody has this executive assistant who really understands them. The real possibility of all of this is you get to actually from today, not based on the inertia 50 years ago or from 2008, what does software look like? What is window managing? What does an operating system? What's a networking stack? What's identity? What's storage? And we actually get a chance to be eager, ambitious, or foolish enough to do something about it. So we filmed the main episode a few weeks ago and now it's kind of the, the eve of the launch. What's, uh, what's the feeling like? It's interesting. Like you have this thing you've spent six years working towards and still the things that are giving me the most amount of gratification and excitement are the little things. The launch is a launch. Like, it's kind of just like, okay. It doesn't feel like apathy. It doesn't feel like a lack of celebration. It just feels like a reorienting of what really matters in the process. Launching the tablet, getting out into the world is, is, is on our, our entrance. And after that, if things go well, what's cool about our screen technology and the kind of humane operating system we're building is what comes next is we can make a distraction-free 60 FPS e-ink phone. We can make a 60 FPS e-ink laptop. We can make monitors, we can make calendars, we can make whiteboards. Our kind of ambition is what does public benefit Apple look like? And instead of virtual reality as the future of spatial computing, how about real reality? How about taking the surfaces in our house, kind of like all the stuff I have here on the wall, but make them computational. And so we have a vision of these kind of e-ink screens all over the place with your calendar, with your whiteboard, your affirmations, whatever it may be. We're starting Sumble with a tablet, and then who knows where we go from there, but it's probably a phone next. So what's it like to be holding this after six years and using it? It's hard to believe it's real. It's hard to believe that it's, it's mine. It's hard to believe that uh, it works. Uh, you know, you kind of forget that you're actually doing 
all this to build something because it takes so long and it's so hard. And so there's just this um, surrealness of like, oh, I'm not a fraud. Like I've had imposter syndrome my whole life. And it's like, oh, this thing exists here because um, a lot of people, but myself included, worked our asses off and uh, you can't fake this, you can't fake it.